Dr. Dinosaur is here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I'm coming to you live right now from our amazing collections facility in the basement of the museum. And this is where we store all of our fossils. But really I'm ex most excited today to share with you all of the cool fossils that are associated with our brand new exhibit, Sue the T-Rex Experience, which opens tomorrow here at DMNS. Uh, and it's full of amazing facts and things about T-Rex. You'll learn a ton about Sue, and you'll also learn about Sue's world and other things that lived alongside Sue. Um, so one of the things that you're gonna learn about today uh, is what we've, what we've understood about Sue in the 30 years since Sue was first discovered. So Sue was a, a huge dinosaur that was found in, 19, in the early 1990s in South Dakota. So it's been 30 years now since Sue has been out of the ground and we've had a lot of time to study Sue. And in that time, we found many other dinosaurs and we've learned new things about the way T-Rex was able to move, the way T-Rex uh, was able to eat, and even just the general shape of the body of a T-Rex. So in this exhibit, you'll learn things like uh, why our reconstructions of T-Rex have such a deep body. So it's a much thicker, fatter looking T-Rex than you're probably familiar with. And that's because the belly ribs called gastralia have been added onto the Mount of Sioux. You'll be able to see a full fleshed out reconstruction of Sioux. So you'll see uh, what Sioux would have looked like. You'll be able to get face to face with Sioux as she chomps down on some of the other animals from, from its time period. And you'll be able to uh, investigate some other aspects of Tyrannosaur behavior. What we think that things like T-Rex and Tyrannosaurus sounded like, so some of the sounds they made, and also the battle injuries that things like Sue and other Tyrannosaurs uh, sustained as they went through their really difficult hard lives in the, the late Cretaceous world of Western North America. And when we talk about Sue's world, we're talking about more than just T-Rex. We're talking about things like the plants. We're talking about uh, all the other animals that lived at the time of Sue. And a lot of these are very familiar with you today. There are a lot of the types of trees and animals that if you go outside into your yard in midsummer, you'll be able to see all around you. Um, and the world of Sioux would have looked a lot like the Gulf Coast of North America today. So lush uh, forests full of different types of animals and plants, um, many of them familiar with you today. And I've pulled out a bunch of these fossils to share with you today from our very own collection. So these are fossils that won't be a part of Sioux. So I'm giving you a sneak peek but we've integrated many of our best fossils from down here in our collections into the Sioux exhibit to really show off Sioux's world because this is an area where DMNS has been active for almost 100 years. So some of our first curators uh, were doing work in the Hell Creek in the early 19 teens and 1920s and brought back amazing fossils, some of, the, some of them the first of their kind. One of those I wanna highlight is this. So this is a chunk of bone. This is from an ankylosaur dinosaur. This is probably a notosaur plate from the back. And here at DMNS, we have one of the only skulls of the notosaur from this time period. It's been named Denver Saurus. It was actually named after the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So it was one of the big herbivorous dinosaurs. It didn't have the tail club that you see on other armored dinosaurs like ankylosaurus, which is also featured in this exhibit. But it was a major player in this time period. So this is one of the plant eaters, really a snack for Sue. Some of the other fossils I have around me include duckbill dinosaurs. I'll hold this up. This is a duckbill dinosaur tail vertebra. This was collected from North Dakota. So just across the border from where Sue was found. And this is one of the most common dinosaurs from the time of Sue. This is what we call the, the cattle of the Cretaceous. So this was one of the probably the favorite food sources of Tyrannosaurus rex and other carnivores of its time. And there's amazing fossils in the exhibit and down here in collections. Here's a baby Edmontosaurus upper jaw. So these fossils really teach us about the ecosystem. So from the plants to the herbivores to the carnivores. And I have several other carnivore fossils around me as well. I'll show you some really neat ones. This is the sickle claw. I'll hold up over the white background there. So that's the sickle killing claw from a dromaeosaur or raptor dinosaur that lived at the time of Sioux. We know that one of the raptors was closely related to Velociraptor, which is known from Mongolia. And so Velociraptor relatives like this Akira raptor were running around on the ground, possibly climbing around in the trees and would have been one of the main small predators of the time. I've got other bones here. Let's see, another claw. This is the toe claw. 
of an ornithomimid dinosaur. So this is an ostrich mimic dinosaur. And what's neat about these is that we don't really know for sure exactly what they ate. They don't have the big sharp teeth that you see in raptor dinosaurs or even T-Rex. Uh, they have a, a much more slender uh, mouth. And so they might've been omnivorous. They might've been more generalist. But some of the first fossils of this type of dinosaur were found right here in the Denver metro area. So the very first example of an ostrich mimic dinosaur called Ornithomimus was found just south of Denver in Lakewood. We have other fossils. This is the shin bone or the ankle joint of a big chicken-like dinosaur called Anzu. So Anzu had a big beaked, casped head. And you'll be able to see a picture of Anzu in the exhibit. I brought one here. So this is what an Anzu would have looked like. This is paleo art that's also featured in our exhibit that was done by one of our partners, Andrei Atuchin, who works in Russia. And Anzu is another one of those bizarre animals you might not be familiar with. And you'll be able to get up and close, up close and personal with dinosaurs like Anzu. And then we have other things that you're familiar with. So this weird looking blob is actually the hip bone of a bird, a turkey or vulture sized bird from the time of Sioux. We have other plant eaters. This is the femur of a dinosaur called Desilosaurus, which was a small plant eating two legged dinosaur. And then of course there are other little things in the ecosystem too. So here's a cheekbone of a crocodile. Here's another skull bone from a crocodile. We have turtle bones. So all of this fleshes out the ecosystem of Sioux and helps us understand what Sioux and Sioux's world was really like. And the other great thing that we've been able to integrate into the Sioux exhibit are our local finds. So here in the Denver metro area, if you dig down a couple of feet in your own backyard or you go to a green space and you see a rock cut, many of those rocks come from the same time period as Sioux. It's the very, very, very end of the Cretaceous. So I've pulled out several of those dinosaurs from our collection. This is our most famous recent find. This is Tiny the Taurosaurus, which was found up in Thornton in 2017. And one of the neat things about this exhibit is we're able to show off some of Tiny's original bones for the very first time. And we're also unveiling Tiny's full mounted skeleton for the very first time. So if you come into the museum, you go up our escalators to the second level, you'll be some of the first people to ever experience what it was like to stand right next to Tiny the Taurosaurus. So here you see the snout, this is the beak at the front of the snout. This is Tiny's nose horn. This would have been Tiny's gigantic nostril. We have Tiny's lower jaw. And up on display, we also have parts of Tiny, including the original horn that was discovered, parts of the frill, parts of the shoulder blade, some of the ribs. And all of those are currently under study as we try to understand the big question of whether Taurosaurus and tri Triceratops were the same dinosaur or separate dinosaurs. So this gets into the ecosystem of Sioux and who the different, different herbivorous dinosaurs, different players were at this time period. And the other cool fossil from our local area I wanted to share with you today is this. So this is a big banana sized tooth of what we call the Littleton T-Rex. So this is the only T-Rex with a street address. This was found in 1992. So right around the same time that Sioux was discovered, but this was found in a basement construction area of a new housing development and they included parts of the femur, parts of the ankle, and then obviously parts of the skull. So we have this tooth, we have several other teeth. And this just shows us that here in the Denver metro area, here along the Front Range, we live right on the time of Sioux. And we also live at the same time that we have other fossils um, of the ecosystem. So amazing plant records, amazing evidence of the asteroid that killed out the dinosaurs. And then one of the other neat tie-ins that we have at the museum is our recent discovery of the animals that lived right after Sioux's time. So we have things like this really amazing turtle shell that we collected from Colorado Springs. And this is from right after dinosaurs go extinct. So just after Sioux disappears. So if you come and check out Sioux, you should also check out some of these fossils from right after Sioux's world. And those are also highlighted in our Sioux exhibit. And I could talk about our collections forever and take you around and show you all these different cabinets. But what I really wanna do is hear your questions and answer some of your questions that you might have about Sioux, T-Rex or Sioux's world. Awesome. Hello again, Joe. And hello, Facebook and YouTube audience. My name is Memory Williams. I work in the marketing department here at the museum. And 
As usual, I am here just to share your questions with our presenter, Dr. Joe Cetric. Okay, so um, I'm looking at Facebook and YouTube. So just go ahead and drop those questions in the comments and we will get them to Joe. Um, just gonna read you a few comments that we've gotten so far. Um, we have Michael who says science rocks. Yes, we definitely agree with that, Michael. All right, Sue, who is also named Sue, surprisingly, Sue Small from Facebook says, I have my ticket for Friday and I can't wait. Awesome, we'll look for you. Yes, yes. We have another comment from Brandon who says, I wanna go see Sue and I just drew a picture of Sue just now, wow. Look at that, so cool. lots of excitement about Sue. Like I said, if you have any questions, you can just go ahead and drop them. But while those are coming in, how about I ask, I can get a start. I'll ask a question, Joe. Okay. So if you could identify just one or maybe your favorite part of Sue the T-Rex experience, um, what would be your favorite part of this exhibition? Well, if I can, I like to say there's two parts. So I really love getting up close to Sue. Anytime you're around a T-Rex skeleton and a T-Rex skull, you really get that that wow factor that, you know, I first experienced when I was a little kid and I still get it every time I'm near a T-Rex. And then the other thing I'm really excited about with this exhibit is being able to share all of our local finds. So we're really lucky in the Denver metro area that we live right on top of Sue's world. So all this evidence of the plants and animals that lived alongside Sue and T-Rex fossils themselves come from right here under our feet, basically stretching from the south suburbs of Denver all the way up toward Northern Colorado. Interesting, interesting. All right, we got some more questions coming in. I see some coming in on Facebook. Sue says, Rar. <laughs> you. Okay, here's one from Susan who asked, what is the most common dinos in Colorado? That's a great question. Yeah, Colorado has two main windows into the dinosaur time period. One is the Morrison formation. So that is late Jurassic in age. And that has dinosaurs that you're familiar with like Stegosaurus and Allosaurus and the big Brontosaurus. And so some of those fossils, especially the long neck sauropod dinosaurs are among the most common that you find uh, here in Colorado because they're so big and so robust and they really survive the transport and really the erosion that's happened since 150 million years ago. So there's a ton of dinosaurs from that time period. And then when you get into the late Cretaceous, you have another window and that's called the Denver Formation. And that's what sits right under Denver, Colorado Springs, all the way up into places like Boulder and Fort Collins. And in those rock units, you get things like Triceratops. So by far the most common chunks you find are pieces of Triceratops ribs, pieces of Triceratops frills. So the big shield behind the head breaks into big plates. And those are encountered almost any time you go out and look at these rocks. Very nice. All right, we have one from YouTube from Mr. Edit Undo, um, who says, I thought we have young to old fossils of Taurosaurus, making them a different species from Triceratops. Yeah, so the big debate about Triceratops versus Taurosaurus is whether or not Taurosaurus is just the very old adult form of Triceratops, which would make it the same as Triceratops. So the weird features you see on Taurosaurus, including the really thin frill with big windows called fenestrae, uh, whether that's a feature that comes along late in life or whether it's a separate species and that's just a difference between these two different species of horned dinosaur. And that's something we're working on right now. And I think this particular specimen, Tiny the Taurosaurus from Thornton will help us address that question. So what we're doing right now is looking at the limb bones. Ugh. So here's the shin bone of Tiny. And what we're doing is we're cutting into the bone as minimally as we can. And we can look at the different lines in the bone. So they're almost like tree rings. Um, and you can understand the age of a dinosaur when it died. So that's one of the things we want to test with Tiny and see how old Tiny was when it died. Because if it turns out that it's younger than some of our Triceratops fossils, that's really good evidence that Taurosaurus was separate from Triceratops. Interesting. So still a lot to learn and yeah, stay tuned for that research. Yeah, here at the museum. Um, Mark asks, does the museum use volunteers on digs? If so, how do I get involved? Yeah, so one of the, the big things that I do uh, during normal years, at least, is go out and spend at least three or four months digging in places like Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, 
And all of those digs, I bring volunteers. So I usually have crews of about 15 volunteers with me uh, per week, sometimes week after week. And so if you want to get involved, if you want to get out, get your hands dirty, if you want to make some of these discoveries yourself, uh, you just have to go on to our webpage. We have a volunteer portal. Uh, you can sign up as a volunteer. And in that, you can say, I want to do field work. I want to prep fossils, or I want to work down here in the collections. And we'll get you processed. And as soon as we're back and open and ready for volunteers, uh, you'll be in that system. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll drop that link in the comments so that it can be there um, for anybody else who may want to use that as well. Let us see. Oh, the questions are rolling in. Here we have one from Tony who asks, what percentage of dinosaur fossils contain organic matter or are they generally 100% generally rock? Yeah, so with dinosaur fossils, you've probably seen in the news that some soft tissues are showing up, especially in dinosaurs like Triceratops or duckbills and even T-Rex. There's evidence of soft tissues inside the bones. So that would be vascular tissue, things like uh, the walls of blood vessels. But most bone is made out of two components, a collagen or organic component and a mineral component called appetite or hydroxyapatite. And most fossil bones are the original mineral component. So they haven't been replaced. That's the original bone that was precipitated by the animal, which is really cool. That means more than 80% of bones that you hold are the original bone from the animal. However, over time, a lot of those organics do disappear. So most of the collagen most of those other, other evidence, the blood vessels and things like that have disappeared from most dinosaur bones. It's only extreme preservation where you get those very spectacular uh, soft tissue preservation. You also get some of these other biomolecules and other evidence of the, the bone itself. Awesome. Oh, and here's a really great question um, from Chelsea, which is, is really interesting. Um, so do we know if Sue is for sure a girl? If so, how? So that is a big question in paleontology still, which is being able to tell the two different sexes apart of dinosaurs. Um, there is some evidence in a few types of dinosaurs that there might be differences between two different groups, which would suggest differences between sexes, but we still don't even know in those cases, which is which. Um, and in the case of T-Rex, there isn't enough data. There aren't enough specimens to really do those statistical analyses to show two different morphs or two different size classes that we could say are the differences between male and female. And even if we had that, like I said, you can't tell which is which. In modern birds, sometimes the female is bigger and more robust because she has to carry the eggs and do a lot of the work. And in other birds, it's the male that's bigger. So it doesn't really help us know that there's two different sizes um, to be able to describe which is which. And I'll also add that for Sue, we at use they, them pronouns, um, I recently learned, which is really interesting, but just highlights how, you know, we, we're not sure what sex Sue is. Okay, let us see some more questions. We have another one from Sue and who asks, is Sue on loan from the Chicago Museum of Natural History? So the original bones of Sue that are in the original mount are still at the Field Museum in Chicago. What we have here are some of the original bones that didn't make it into that mount. So we have a display of some of the ribs and other pieces from the original site. And the main skeleton is a cast. So this is the up-to-date, most recent information we have on T-Rex encapsulated in this amazing cast of all of the bones of Sue. But Sue was the most and still is the most complete T-Rex we have, over 90% complete. Um, and we've learned so much over the last 30 years by studying Sue. And every time we look at Sue again, we have fresh eyes and we come up with new information. I think we just answered Catherine's question to ask, are any of Sue's real fossils visiting Denver? And Sue remains um, in completion at the Field Museum. Um, we are only having her there. And we do have other animals. So Sue was buried mm -hmm. in a river environment and we have other animals that were at the site where Sue was uncovered. So this is the first time you'll see some of the turtles, some of the other crocodiles and other animals that lived with Sue in that river system that were buried at the same time Sue's skeleton was buried. Awesome. Oh, and we have another question um, from Vanessa who asks, how old is Sue? So some of the work that's been done on aging these dinosaurs has been applied to T-Rex. And we think Sue is one of the oldest individual T-Rex specimens that's been found. And based on the rings or the, the different um, patterns in the bone, we've been able to reconstruct that Sue's around 28 years old. So Sue is about 28 when it died. It's not very old for a big animal. Yeah, not very old. 
Jason asks, at what time were the lower ribs found? So the lower ribs are called gastralia, were found with the original discovery of Sue, but they're really thin and delicate. They took more time to prep out and it took more time to, to kind of get the arrangement settled on how to put them into the skeleton, which is why it took almost 20 years to get those fully cleaned and back up into that mount of, of Sue and the mount that we have here on display through this exhibit. Awesome. Oh, here is an interesting question from uh, Mina. <laughs> you may have to do some calculations to get this answer. I don't know. But Mina asked, how many black widow spiders would it take to take down a triceratops? Oh, sweet. Mm, I think I asked our other curator that question on a Facebook Live. Yeah. I would guess probably about 10,000 black widow spiders mm -hmm. to take down a T-Rex. Awesome. You, you okay. would need a lot of venom. A lot. Yeah, we're going to have to cross-reference that with um, Paula, who we just had on last week, um, speaking about spiders and see how many she thinks. <laughs> take. But that's a good number. That's a good, I'd say about the same, more than likely. About the same. It's all speculative. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Carla who asks, is it safe to assume Sue or any other dinosaur um, are soft, made out of mostly feathers instead of tough skin? Yeah, so the evidence for feathers on dinosaurs has been slowly coming out of the ground for really the last 25 years. Um, a lot of those fossils come from really spectacularly preserved lake beds in China and places like Europe. And there are even some evidence from places here in the Western North American Rocky region. Um, but most of those are on fa small fossils, so smaller raptor sized dinosaurs. But there is evidence from China that T. rex relatives, and I've got a T. rex relative behind me, this is one from here in Utah in North America, but the ones in China are about this size and they're covered in a, a downy coat of, of feathers that stretches from the neck all the way down the tail and probably also adorn parts of the arms and other parts of the body. On T. rex itself, we do have impressions of the skin and if you come to the exhibit, you'll see a, a cast of one of those skin impressions. And in all of the impressions of skin that we have from T. rex, it just shows a pebbly scale surface. That doesn't mean T-Rex didn't have feathers because of course we're only sampling small little patches of skin from places like the chest, uh, the legs, the tail. Uh, there might've been feathers along the neck, along the back, or they may have changed the amount of feathers they had as they got bigger because you have to shed a lot of heat when you're a big animal. Um, but when you're a little animal, you need to retain that heat. So maybe they had feathers to help insulate them when they were small and slowly shed those feathers as they got big. Elephants do that today. So if you've seen a small baby elephant, it'll be covered in little bristly hairs. But by the time you get to a big elephant, you just have sparse hairs over that big tough hide. Interesting, interesting. Oh, here's another good question from Eric who asks, what is the name of our T-Rex in the lobby um, downstairs? Does that T-Rex have a name? We don't have a, a human-like name. We call it the dancing Rex. So that's the dancing T-Rex because it's, Arms yeah. are up in the air, it's got one leg up in the air, it's tilted back, it's screaming. And so that's <laughs> always been called the dancing Rex or the dancing T-Rex. Tony asked, um, do we know why Sue died relatively young? So Sue was, like I said, was only 28, but for a T-Rex that might've been really old. So in those 28 years, Sue sustained major injuries to its body, had broken ribs that were healing, it had a broken fibula that was healing. It had an infection along the entire, I guess it was the left side of the lower jaw, probably a bacterial infection that was eating away at the bone. And so by the time Sue was 28, it was really like a much older human. So there was arthritis in joints in the tail, there was arthritis along the back. Um, and so we think that T-Rex probably died around 28 to 30 years old. That was probably the maximum uh, longevity of a T-Rex. Awesome. Oh, we're getting a few more questions. Um, is there evidence in Sue um, of disease or parasitic damage to the bones? Um, and I think you've kind of covered some of the known ailments we, we know they had at the time of, of their death. Yeah, those are called pathologies and Sue is full of pathologies. And a lot of dinosaurs are. We have another dinosaur in our prep lab window called Pops that was found here. It's a Triceratops specimen from Northern Colorado. And Pops has lots of evidence of arthritis. There's a, a chunk of tail that's all fused together. Um, there's other joints that have uh, lesions and bone erosion. So we know that these dinosaurs live really hard lives based on these pathologies. Interesting. 
Marissa asks, how much does a T-Rex weigh? Well, it depends on the T-Rex because we have different sizes. So we now know that T-Rex comes from many different size classes uh, from juvenile to adult, but an adult T-Rex would have been over 10 tons. So it's the size of a really large bull elephant, really, really big animal. Huge. We have another question from Mina who asks, are there any known non-binary or gender non-conforming dinosaurs? We don't know. Just because we don't know about normal dinosaur behavior, we don't know about the normal um, structure of dinosaur systems, the dinosaur populations, we don't know about different types of dinosaurs um, that fall along our spectrum that we have today. Oh, here's another one. Um, from Marissa, who asks, where are raptors usually found? So raptor dinosaurs come from mostly Cretaceous deposits. Some of the first ones show up in the late Jurassic in places like Wyoming and the Morrison Formation, but they become really, really common in Cretaceous rocks. So all through the last age of dinosaurs, we have different types of raptor dinosaurs. Those include the true dromaeosaurs, which are the true raptors, the velociraptorines, which you're familiar with, and even smart, big-brained raptors called troodontids that lived at the same time. And all of them shared that sickle claw, that big killing claw on its toe. Speaking of um, T-Rex toes and claws, um, we have a question from Gary who asked, why slash what purpose did the very short forearm serve on T-Rexes? Do we know that yet? Yeah, we still are learning a lot about T-Rex. We know that it had small arms and small is relative. So a T-Rex arm is actually bigger than my arm. So if I laid my arm next to a, a, a replica of Sue's arm, it would be slightly longer, but it's small for its size. It had huge muscle attachment. So it was using it for something. We think of it as possibly being vestigial sometimes. Vestigial means it's, it's functionless, but we know that that's probably not true based on those muscle scars. So it was using those little teeny arms for some purpose. We just don't know what it was yet. Interesting. All right, and I see a question from Melissa who asks, um, for you, Joe, what is the most compelling slash interesting find you have personally been involved with? Well, I've been really lucky to be able to travel the world, look for dinosaurs in places like East Africa and Antarctica and Madagascar. And some of the neatest fossils I found come from right here in North America. So we have several new types of um, dome-headed dinosaur, horned dinosaur, and some of those are, I think, the, the coolest fossils I found in places like Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And it really underscores the importance of protecting land for science. So these all come from public lands here in the United States. So there's a lot to be found. And if you want to be a paleontologist and you want to get out and you want to find fossils, don't worry, there's plenty more eroding out every day. So just going in our backyards and get to digging. <laughs> Why not? How about we let Melissa's question be our last question, um, but we still have Joe around. If you're watching this video later on, feel free to just drop your questions in the comments and we can still get that to Joe. Joe, any last words for our dino loving audience you wanna leave us with? Well, I hope all of you get a chance to come and see Sue while it's here in Denver, because first of all, it's amazing. I love T-Rex. You probably love T-Rex. Everyone wants to be around a T-Rex, but then you can be around all these other neat finds that are coming out of the ground right here in the Denver area. Um, some of them are going to really change the way we think about Sue's world, including dinosaurs like Tiny, the Taurosaurus. Awesome. And like you said, Sue opens tomorrow to the public. I'm just going to drop that link um, to Sue on our website in the comments, just so you can take a look at that if you want. Um, but until next week, we will be right back here next Thursday at 12 o'clock to do Science Division Live. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.